Printed for your convenience this morning is the gospel lesson in your bulletin. You might want to follow along as we dissect this passage together. Five clergy gathered together in Tim Hortons one day and they had an argument about the best translation of the Bible. And the Roman Catholic priest turned to the others and said, I like the King James Version best. It's proper, it's dignified, it's the same. United Pastor said, well, I like the Revised Standard Version best. It's a little more simple. It's clear. Presbyterian Pastor said, well, I like the Good News Version. It's even simpler. It's clear. I get it. Someone else said, well, you know, I like the New International Version. I think that it has clarity and is succinct. And the Anglican said, no. So they all assumed that he didn't preach the gospel and that he hadn't read the Bible. And one of them had enough guts to turn and say, hey you, you never say anything when we talk about the Bible. He said, I believe in uh, my grandmother's translation of the Bible. They said, really? That's not official? <coughs> We've never heard that released? He said, my grandmother's translation is, she read it and she lived it. That's my favorite translation of the Bible. So let's look at a Bible passage together. This is the most loving, sensitive, compassionate, sensitive passage in Scripture. This is about a woman's honest, sincere love for her Lord. This is about a prostitute who decides that she's come to the crossroads of her life and she doesn't want to be and do what she is and what she's doing. But it's more. There are moments in the next few moments that you may say, where is he going? So bear with me as we go verse by verse and dissect the passage for the revelation that comes with the good news of the end. We begin, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with them, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. This is the beginning of the passage. You need to understand that the Pharisee did not know Jesus, but invited him for dinner. Have you ever been in the car on your way to somebody's house and asked yourself this question, why am I invited? What's the motive? I've got to tell you over the years, since parishioners have arrived at our home for dinner about halfway through, somebody has always said to us over the years, okay, so why am I really here? I thought it was roast beef and potatoes. But they assumed a motive. And motive in this passage, and motive in people's behavior is so important that we need to consider it today. So Jesus arrives at the Pharisee's house. It's crowded. It's probably a very long table in a huge room. And his guest says to him, Oh, Jay, you're over there. No, keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah, over there. Oh, by the way, great to see you. He doesn't wash his hands. On his way in, he doesn't wash his feet as the tradition welcome. He doesn't know his head as a prophet. He doesn't embrace him in love and encouragement. He just says, down at the end is your seat. And Jesus arrives and the table is about this high off the ground. And so he reclines on the cushions that are provided and puts his elbow on the table with his feet pointing away from the table. That's really important. Stay with me. And then it happens. When a woman who had lived in a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. This is really important because alabaster perfume is very expensive, which means she was doing really well as the local prostitute. And it says that she heard that the Pharisee was hosting the party. 
party. Who did she hear from? Her client the night before, who's in the room. Have I got you yet? A matter of fact, she knew most of the men in the room. In a biblical sense. <laughs> And nobody said hi. Did you notice that? Nobody wandered over to her and said, Hey, how you doing? Not one. Not one. Just in case she could call them by name. And when she arrives, and she's heard Jesus is there, she brought this alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet, she started to cry, and she began to weep and wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissing them and pouring perfume on them. You need to know two things about this. Number one, you don't wash somebody's feet easily with tears. This takes a while. She's sobbing. She's pouring out her heart to him. She's ready for a change. And she knows that he is that engine of transformation. <clears throat> And she's crying on his feet. And then she takes her hair and she wipes them dry and pours the most expensive perfume on them. This is profound. And the reason that it is, is that ointment on a body at that time in history and in that culture was about preparing them for death. Or just after their death. It is a foreshadowing of his death and resurrection, and it's done by the local prostitute who's come to that crossroads to make a decision about her life. And as the passage goes on, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman it is. <laughs> That she's a sinner. <clears throat> Jesus knew exactly who he was and who she was. He'd known since before she was born. And he loved her. And he accepted her the way she was and invited her to grow. And he knew that she was in that moment of making a decision to go a new direction with her life. And that this was a moment of love and penance. You see, there's never love without penance. Never penance without love. We are in a constant state of God's grace and forgiveness. And that only comes with both penance and love. And yet the Pharisee says, do you know her? Of course he knows her. He knows who she is and what she is, and he loves her anyway. So here's the moment. Do we turn to someone and say, I've decided what kind of person you are, and therefore I'll judge you on what I've heard about you? Or do we simply acknowledge that each of us are persons? With strengths and weaknesses, vulnerabilities and uncertainties, and that we invite people to become who they are and invite them to grow in Christ. 